Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you here. My name is Shelley Graff, and I usually lead these Wednesday night gatherings. And we generally start with about a half an hour meditation. So we'll do that now if you want to get yourselves into a comfortable posture to sit for about a half an hour. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Great, thanks. We can take a few deep breaths together. Just to invite the nervous system to settle. It might even help to remember the value of settling. Just to allow whatever comes to the surface to be there when you consider the value of settling. Of somehow living with a settled nervous system. We don't somehow have to generate a belief, like a belief that we're capable of settling, but really just landing in this deep held value. that it's important to be able to settle the nervous system. To live with a stable heart, a grounded presence. And as we consider this, what kinds of things might come forward? Perhaps those we love come to mind. Or maybe how we move about in the world, our responsibilities, maybe that comes to mind, our work even. It's really okay to use the thinking mind this way. To remember what's important to us. To consider the value of a stable presence. Of a grounded presence. We 
you might notice that naturally from this place of considering or reflecting an intention to cultivate this grounded presence comes forward. An intention to be here in the present moment to know what it's like to be fully present So we skillfully cultivate this willingness to receive all of the realities of our present moment's experience. The thoughts and feelings Sounds, body sensations, our environment, the conditions, Remembering that this intention that we're cultivating to be present, to be here doesn't require life to be pleasant. This willingness to renew our connection to our deepest values provides the ground that this willingness, this willingness of the heart to connect no matter what's here, if it feels pleasant or unpleasant. Love is cooperating and or not.
It starts courageous willingness to say yes. Yes to this. This imperfect moment. It's the ground of equanimity. feeling into the presence of other humans, even over Zoom, or just gazing at the names. Yeah. You can wave, smile at each other. <laughs> hey, friends. So, 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 let's see here. So I wanna, I wanna say something. Well, I'll say a lot of things, but I'll start with this. 
during the meditation as we were kind of feeling into our values, I was really connecting with this intention to to really make sense of our lives, to really make sense of my life. And I've said different versions of this over the weeks, but I want to say it again, that I feel like it's our responsibility as practitioners, as people who are training in this path, to really feel into the context that we're living in, to feel the internal and the external conditions, and to ask the questions, ask the questions about that leads us to some, not even answers, but deepening on the path. Like the questions about how is our practice relevant now, given the conditions of our lives, the conditions that we're living in and within, how is our practice relevant now? And that necessarily includes everything. It includes the pandemic and the changes in the pandemic and the changes in the, our health and our, the health of our loved ones and friends and people we don't know. It includes all of the environmental crises that we're living within, the Line 3, the Enbridge Pipeline crises right now. It includes all all of the racial injustice. It includes the political climate, the election. It includes all of this. And so I feel this responsibility as a leader, as someone who's sharing, a teacher, someone who's sharing to illuminate our practice to somehow point to these areas that might feel um, complicated. But this is our, our life. And so it's not an attempt to somehow divide or over, uh, over highlight one area and not the other, but really to shed some light on this responsibility that we have to practice right in the middle of our lives, right in the middle of everything, to not exclude something because we think it's out of bounds or we want to somehow nest in this bubble of comfort that pushes away the complexity of life. So perhaps this doesn't need to be said, but it I feel some relief even just to give voice to this for, for myself and hopefully for us as a community. Because I want us to not be afraid to wrestle with the teachings. Really, that's what I'm doing. And this is, this is how we learn how to live in complexity is by wrestling with the teachings right here in this complicated moment. It's not easy. Like the Buddha's path was not easy. The Buddha went this way and that way and experimented and probably made a lot of changes to how he was practicing. Not probably, he did. And so did many other beings on their path of awakening. And this is what we are supposed to do. So I want to somehow bring that forward in a way that feels really normal. It is normal to wrestle with your practice, to wrestle with the teachings, to feel the tension of not understanding, to feel the tension, because that is the tension that allows us to deepen our understanding. And as a community, then, we get to give voice to our own diverse experience from each other, because we're not all living the same way. We're not all exposed to external conditions in the same way. Our lives reflect different aspects of humanity, of justice. You know, our lives are not, we're not, if you're a brown-bodied person, your life is 
different than it is for me in this white-bodied experience, like it or not. And so we can start to like really explore what does this mean to practice and learn together in the diversity that brings us together. Nod your head if you're with me. All right. So today has been a big day for us, for me, for sure, and probably for most, if not all of you, that perhaps, you know, you are like me and have seen a variety of emotions come and go, flow through the heart. And we I woke up to news about the Georgia election and for a while was really sort of writing this appreciation, like a lot of gratitude in the heart that so many people were invested in voting. So many people participated both this time and also in November. And that Black and Latino and Indigenous people came out in record numbers to demand their voices be heard. I felt really grateful that there were so many, uh, so much participation. And then this afternoon and evening brought a different flavor of condition. And there wasn't so much gratitude acknowledging the election and acknowledging the attempted coup right, at the federal capitol and the protesters and all of that, all that has ensued this evening. And so much of what we are living within is rooted in racial, uh, is rooted in racial conditioning and a deep, I think for many of us, interest in racial justice. And it was um, easy to notice the, uh, that there is among many of us a shared interest, a shared interest, and I think a shared commitment to understanding racism, to feeling into what it's like to be a racial being in this world, and to finding our way forward to a more humane together, a more humane way of addressing issues of racism, anti-black racism for uh, especially, and also feeling into the backlash of that as white fragility and white supremacy are on full display for us and within us, right? Because we don't participate outside of that system. So the question, another question is how do we receive what is being exposed and how do we receive what's being exposed as a teaching that, ex that illuminates for us the areas to be curious about how the teachings touch our lives. Resolve is a central theme in Buddhism. It's a, one of the 10 paramis and also a habit of mind that can be cultivated and a state of mind worth noticing. So I've been sort of curious about this, what feels to me like life energy that somehow gets, sometimes gets pulled out of balance like any life energy does, but this willingness to persevere, to continue to find courageous ways to live our lives. 
And this willingness to see where the teachings intersect in our lives is one of those ways. To really not let ourselves off the hook and just be floundering human beings, but we're practitioners. And so we're looking for how the teachings align with our lived experience right here and now. And a couple of the ways that resolve shows up in our lives and is in uh, right intention. So this part of the Eightfold Path that is about wisdom. So right intention and right view are the wisdom-oriented parts of the path. The path can be divided into three parts. We've got wisdom and samadhi or uh, settled, like a settled nervous system or a settled mind. And then sila or our, eth our training around ethics, how we live. So we might translate this right intention to also include right resolve, right? right resolve or right intention. You might say that interchangeably. We might also talk about resolve as the energy behind moral restraint. And this is what we might call ethic, our ethical training, or the Pali word is sila. So right intention, this resolve to, to really watch the mind and notice when it is, when the mind is spinning in some unhealthy places, contempt, jealousy, indulgence and rage, not feeling good enough, these things, to notice when the mind is spinning and, and understand like, oh, this is probably not a healthy place for the mind to be. It's probably not a healthy place for me to live. Right? To acknowledge that, to notice it, is an expression of wisdom. And so the intention why we might call right intention resolve is because it takes the resolve to continue to notice what seeds our actions. So when the mind is spinning, we can see that to indulge that, to indulge this jealousy only continues to create havoc on my mind and therefore on my life. In this other way that we might understand resolve is the resolve to not cause harm. So in relationship to the Noble Eightfold Path, this is what the Buddha says about resolve in relationship to the path. It starts like this, and how is right view the forerunner? One deserves one discerns wrong resolve as wrong resolve and right resolve as right resolve. Right? So wisdom, right view is another way to describe wisdom, is that discerning quality of the mind that understands when we're not on track, right? When the mind is spinning in a place that isn't very healthy or when the mind is cultivating habits that are skillful and useful in our lives. One discerns wrong resolve as wrong resolve and right resolve as right resolve. And what is wrong resolve? Being resolved on sensuality, on ill will and harmfulness. This is wrong resolve. So when the mind kind of spins or cultivates these habits that aren't gonna lead to uh, skillful living for myself or you, for ourselves or each other. This is what we might, this is what we might notice connected in connection with wrong resolve. One tries to abandon wrong resolve and to enter into right resolve. When we notice the mind is spinning in unhelpful places, 
then we notice that and we adjust, right? Like, oh, this isn't going to be helpful. Let me see if I can give the mind something else to do. Let me see if I can cultivate goodness. One tries to abandon wrong resolve and enter into right resolve. This is one's right effort. This is the effort that it takes, right? One is mindful to abandon wrong resolve and enter in and remain in right resolve. This is one's right mindfulness. Apply, we can find the qualities, right view or wisdom, right effort and right mindfulness run and circle around right resolve. So we might think of resolve as accountability for ourselves and this willingness to continue to notice when our minds are spinning in unhelpful places, unhealthy places, and to, to have the resolve to not allow that to continue. Yeah. And we will surely visit these places because this is just what humanness is like, right? It's, we're not going to be perfect and um, we're going to see often practice illuminates for us all of the imperfections of our lives, right? Like, oh, I don't really want to see how uh, this mind is so unskillful so much of the time. And so that's just the truth of life. But we will, we can really be diligent about abandoning or not allowing ourselves to reside in these places long term, because it doesn't actually feel good. And it doesn't yield any of the benefits that we are looking for. And it's this willingness to set down something that's unskillful that we start to actually um, taste this abiding quality of love that is there. We can think about love as sometimes in really romantic or aspirational ways, like it's some unattainable place be super loving or intensely loving, but we might actually think about love or loving kindness as the absence of hatred, the absence of ill will, this abandoning unskillful places is an expression of loving kindness, is an expression of non-hatred. And at times, this came up for me as something that might be useful to talk about tonight because it, it can feel like the more complicated um, life is, sometimes the more chaotic, sometimes the, uh, the way it feels so difficult, like how do I be human and how, how do I practice and live in a way that really contributes to the good of my life and each other and it's so complicated right now. It can feel like, you know, sometimes the mind just goes, well, screw it. You know, it's right now it's justifiable to let myself spin in hatred. This is a justifiable circumstance for that. But resolve is actually about seeing how that doesn't make sense. Because at some point our habits will catch up to us. Right? At some, and it will often be the point where we need skillfulness the most. And we can see this play out in ordinary ways, or we can see this play out in, uh, in the collective, in the political climate that we're living in. And when, when the mind, you know, when the mind and many minds together create lots of problems. Minds that spin in hatred create lots of problems. Minds that spin in ill will create lots of collective problems. Minds that spin in hatred and ill will cannot take care of the earth and each other in, in ways that we need to be able to take care of the earth and each other right now. 
So it's really in our best interest, in, our, in the collective interest of our well-being, to really tune in, to resolve, and to find ways to have the moral restraint and to take care of the mind when it starts to spin in these unskillful places so that we don't perpetuate, continue to perpetuate these cycles that we are all living in right now. I've been, I'm getting ready to lead, co-lead a retreat next weekend for Insight Meditation Society with two dear friends of mine, Nakaway Cuevas and Devin Berry. And it is over Martin Luther King holiday. It's hard to even talk about that day without feeling somehow it minimizes the longevity and contribution that this amazing being had in our lives. And not only the contribution, Martin Luther King Jr., but Reverend King, but of all activists. And, and um, also the complicated, the kind of complicatedness of, uh, of their contributions, right? They're not, all of us as human beings, we are multidimensional and somehow reading or studying, you know, I've been feeling into this myself, just listening to, I've been inundated, just listening to past sermons and reading many of the speeches and reading some of the things that other people have said about Dr. King and feeling like, oh, he was a very, he had so much depth to him at such a young age. And somehow picking one thing out of something that he said really misses the whole complicated, you know, ness of his offering that feels so rich and necessary. One of the th one of the phrases that can often be picked out from um, his teachings is this instruction to love your enemy, to love our enemy. And it's like somehow saying that if we choose to love our enemy and we also combine that with nonviolence, that somehow justifies our passivity. But it's much more, it's a much more complex scenario than that. And our, I think Martin Luther King did such a beautiful job at speaking into um, from re from talking about resolve to the unresolvability of human suffering. He often said something like, I'd rather be dead than afraid, which to me really commu communicates this unwavering resolve to continue to participate and um, feel into the discomfort and the unresolvability of suffering and the complexity of life to not know what to do or how to move forward, but to really ask his spiritual practice for something from that he might rely on. And this is what we do as practitioners, as Buddhist practitioners training too. We're asking, we're asking for the teachings to be illuminated in the complexity of life. Because love your enemy is not that straightforward. Is that easy to do? Love your enemy? No, it's absolutely not easy to do, is it? And one of the things he has said in, in connection with that is that liking, that loving is, is really important for us to do at all times. But liking is overly sentimental and not something that's easy to do. So making this distinction there. I'd like to read a little bit of something. that illuminate some of the complexity of the journey as a spiritual seeker. 
for him and perhaps for us. This is from this famous letter from a Bir Birmingham jail. I must make two confessions, two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past years, I have been gravely disappointed with a white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the KKK or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. So much here. that we can consider. One of the, one of the places of inquiry for me is this pointing to how white people, white moderates seek an absence of tension And I wonder if that's something that we do in this community with our Buddhist practice. If we seek this absence of tension, if we try to resolve this tension with suffering to somehow make it easier for ourselves to somehow make it so that we don't have to wrestle in the complexity of our lives. Rather, valuing this false sense of peace that really is spiritual bypass. Like avoiding right here, this. Right here seeing that black people in Georgia voted in large numbers. What were they saying? What were they saying? And to really listen to, to what people are saying in protest. What are they saying? What are we hearing here? And how do we wrestle with that reality? With the reality of a divided country? And so that it's not just for this understanding, but Dr. King illuminated this resolve that included disappointment and despair and frustration, right? And these are all human emotions that we in this room all experience. But to find that resolve to continue to participate in meaningful ways, to not let ourselves off the hook with our participation, which is why racism and political, the, the political landscape of our times has to be included in our spiritual practice. Because it is this, it is here that we wrestle and become, we find our way to uh, deepening our connection with one another, 
living into the interconnection that is our combined reality. You know, I many some of you might have been there last night when Ayo Yatunde was at the Dharma Among Us and um, really posed this question as she does so often. Pose this question that is necessary for us to contemplate. What kind of Buddhist community do you understand? Part. What do you want to look like? Who do you want to be together? How are you? What are you willing to do about that? And we can find our resolve here. One of the things she asked many years ago that I will probably not forget is, is this a community that would die for each other? That's a good question. I don't know. But I find the inquiry now more important than ever because our lives are at stake and not, not everybody's lives are at stake. It doesn't feel that way. But our brown siblings are under fire. And what are we going to do as a community to find the resolve to understand our interconnectedness right here? How are we, are we going to be willing to put our lives on the line to participate in ways that are going to not let each other off the hook, not let our systems off the hook, not let our politicians off the hook for creating the kind of world that we want to be a part of. Dr. King goes on to say, but the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. And we can think of ourselves as a kind of church, a Buddhist community, spiritual community. I think we can change the word church for something else if we want. If today's church or spiritual community does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meeting for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Per perhaps I have once again been too optimistic. Is organized religion too inextricably bound to the status quo to save our nation and the world? To me, this echoes Io's question. What community do we want to be? How do we want to show up? What kind of courage and resolve does it take to do that? And I'm just really hoping that one way we can do that is to learn how to wrestle with these places that feel complicated to wrestle in. Perhaps I've already said things that make you go, I'm not quite sure about that, Shelley. I'm not feeling that, or that's not what I've learned. Or perhaps you felt my hesitation in ways that you wish I didn't hesitate. And this is the tension that I'm living in as a practitioner. And I'm hoping that you're living in too as a practitioner as we find our way together. The Buddha said, 
of two people who practice the Dhamma in line with the Dhamma, having a sense of Dhamma, having a sense of meaning, one who practices for both, for both his own benefit and that of others, and one who practices for his benefit but not that of others. The one who practices for his own benefit but not that of others is to be criticized for that reason. The one who practices for both his benefit and that of others is for that reason to be praised. And as Buddhist practitioners, as spiritual beings, we are well suited for this work of really understanding deeply what this means. Cultivating this grounded habit of mind and the depth of resolve that penetrates unskillful habits. No, I'm not going to let this heart linger in hatred. No, I'm not going to just stand by and allow others to do the same. I'm not going to allow that from people I care about. I'm not going to allow that from politicians and leaders. I'm actually going to participate in disrupting that. And we don't have to know what that looks like, but that resolve is this willingness to keep investigating, to keep figuring it out. What does it mean now? What does it mean now? How do I do that? How do I not stand for this heart lingering in hatred? How do I say, no, it's not okay for you to do that either? How do we stand shoulder to shoulder and demand that of our systems, groups? This is a question that is really lingering for me right now. And I think it should be lingering for all of us. This recent book, this book that Io um, just edit, was just published, it's called Black and Buddhist, What Buddhism Can Teach Us About Race, Resilience, Transformation, and Freedom. It was a book that she co-edited with Cheryl Giles and uh, features a, a number of essays from Black Buddhist teachers, and I would really highly recommend it. I know some of us have been really, it's more than enjoying it. It's a serious teaching. So I would encourage you to consider it. And in this chapter that I authored, she says, She's speaking directly to African Americans, but it feels like a inquiry for us all. We don't always know who the warriors are, what their tactics are, or how long they will fight. But we do know that if we don't cultivate peace of mind in the midst of external strife, we will do the opponent's job for them. Nothing is better for the opponent than our own self-destruction. Why give them that satisfaction? Informed by black feminist lesbian poet Audre Lorde, we believe the act of self-preservation in the face of another's attempt to annihilate us is one of the highest forms of spiritual practice there is. Mindfulness, meditation, and no self is self-preservation and contributes to remarkable relational resilience. Let us commit to cultivating peace of mind and peace of body as we struggle for liberation. Let us be refuges for each other so that our collective souls and collective selves may be nourished for generations of communities to come and let our rest be used for the reparative work we know is ahead of us. And once again, such resolve in that statement, a resolve, a resolve to demand that our spiritual practice meet us in the complexity of our lives. To help us understand what it is that we're doing, how it is that we can prioritize our collective liberation. Not be afraid to be warriors and actually not be afraid to rest when self-preservation is what is needed.
resolve. It feels like life force energy. It's a moral restraint. Of our actions and speech. The willing to, to say no, to stop unskillful behaviors. And this right intention or wise intention or wise resolve to not allow our minds to spin in places that will naturally lead to unhelpful actions, unhelpful speech, and helpful actions in the world. So thank you for your patience and attention tonight. We have about 15 minutes left. And I'd love to spend this time in conversation and really ask you to think about the contribution you're making here to the collective. And so as you consider what you might say, feel into where the teachings connect with your life, where the connections, con where the teachings connect this, the teachings on resolve, if you will, connect up with the messiness, the complexity of this world that we're living in that demands our participation and our responsibility to participate. And as you speak, speak into the collective with some understanding that this will make a difference. Because here I am taking responsibility for my own learning and sharing that with others. For better or for worse, you don't have to be perfect. Right? Hopefully, if I gave a talk on resolve in another year, it would sound different because I would learn something. And that was true for you too, right? So don't be afraid to say something that you might change your mind on later. You feel welcome to just unmute yourself and don't be afraid to wrestle with some of what I've said tonight too difficult it is to love the enemy. I mean, in a moment when this and yet not difficult at all, you know, because just like feeling into that as I was saying that because there's a so, you know, I can really love can meet meet us where we need it to. And I, I totally get that because it's not that hard for me to hold some of the Trump protesters in my heart in love, right? Because I see the suffering there and I can feel like oh, the suffering in my heart that is there. These are, you know, human beings who have been shaped by ideas and experiences just like me and where hatred lives in their heart, hatred lives in mine. And where misunderstanding lives in their heart, it also lives in mine. And where they get caught, I also get caught. So that's not difficult, right? That's like the ease of holding people who have different views than mine in love. And yet love can also unequivocally say no to the annihilation of others. Like it is, you know, love can... Be there. That's an expression, like I think that's what the distinction Dr. King was making, though I don't know for sure, but with the like and love. Right? Not liking is sentimental. That's it. Fine, I, there are a lot of things I don't like. But is it possible to still hold, it's like holding humanity in my heart. Well, that's not hard to do because we see what is shared there. We see the suffering that's shared there and how that's created. And our spiritual practice helps us understand that, how suffering is created. It is one minute to nine. Oh, yes, nine. I'm on the East Coast. It's one minute to ten here. And so I just want to say thank you once again for your participation tonight. And then ask my friend Patrice to dedicate the merit for us, if you will, Patrice. So... I always talk about dedicating the merit, you know, as this wonderful, joyful practice of 
imaginative generosity. But given Shelley's talk tonight and the events of the day, um, it may take some resolve for us truly wholeheartedly and authentically to share whatever, whatever goodness um, we've had. It really is a, a practice of, of resolve. So let's take a moment and reflect on the blessings that have come to us, the blessings of community, the blessings of hearing the Dharma from Shelley, from each other, and truly, truly resolve that if there's any blessing, any merit, any benefit from what we've done tonight, that we would wholeheartedly and completely offer it to others without, without restraint. We would offer it to our parents, our teachers, our friends, our family, our community. We would offer it to those we like and those we don't like. We would offer it to those who hunger and thirst for justice and for those whom in their confusion and their ill will are barriers to justice. And we offer it to all the creatures, the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the wingeds, the scaly, the slithery. We offer it to our whole planet, to all the beings there, unreservedly. May whatever blessings we've had, may we share it with others. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings truly, truly find deep liberation. Thank you, Patrice. Good night, friends. Good night.